My name is Bill Mason, and I play keyboards here at Free Chapel. I came to Free Chapel in September of 2000, so I've been here a while. <laughs> Pastor's message, you know, love like you've never been hurt, uh, it reminded me of my father before I got saved, uh, and I was playing in the clubs, you know, every week, and my father was a pastor, and I was a very rebellious kid. I was the only child. It wasn't so much the scene as it was the lifestyle. You know, when you don't treat people right or when you're in uh, illicit relationships, the clubs just kind of amplified that because you find more people like that who are in that detrimental lifestyle that, that just kind of helps you do what you've been doing. My father would, would come to the clubs and then, you know, I would come and talk to him and he would just love on me. And he always loved me like he had never been hurt. Six months before my father passed away, I was able to work in my father's ministry. Uh, it just was miraculous how God just brought us together. And I had no idea, you know, my father was going to pass away that, that soon. But uh, I'm always so grateful because, you know, as pastor always admonishes us to fight for our family. And you don't know uh, the importance uh, as, a, as a parent or, or as a husband, that, what that means, you know. To be able to do that, only God, I think, can help you to love that way, to look past what a person has done to you and love them as God loves us.
Let's put our hands together and thank God. Thank Him that we're children of the Most High God today. Lord, we bless You. We praise You. We thank You. We honor You. Let's just give Him a great praise right now. He's worthy of the praise. Oh, we bless You, Holy Spirit. We're thankful for Your presence here, Jesus. Bless Your name. I am a child of God. Aren't you thankful that you're a child of God today? Smile at someone and tell them you're in the right place at the right time for the right blessing. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. And all of you at every campus, let's give everybody a warm welcome over at Buford and Gwinnett and Spartanburg and Orange County. They're with us right now. And also soon to be Midtown Atlanta in just a few weeks. We're pretty excited about a new launch. It's going to be taking place there. What a, what a, what a beautiful day it is today to worship the Lord because this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Can I get a big amen? If you have your Bibles, I would like for you to open them with me to the Old Testament. I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy and Bill, thank you for that amazing testimony. And I love this man right here. He's awesome. He's awesome. And I'd never heard that myself until I heard the video in the first service, but it's pretty, pretty powerful love of a preacher to go to the club to hear his son play and love on him. That's love. And that's awesome. And love never fails. Can you say amen? I want to thank all of you for helping us. The book is doing absolutely amazing, and um, it has hit this week number one on Amazon, and even even hit uh, it even hit number eighteen at um, all books of all books out there, secular and Christian. So it's it's reaching a lot of people for the glory of God, and I'm so thankful for that. I want you to look with me in Deuteronomy chapter sixteen. Deuteronomy chapter 16, and when you find 16, go on over to 19, because that's where I am. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 19. <laughs> I did lose an hour's sleep last night, so that's, that's the issue. Deuteronomy chapter 19. You should separate these cities to yourself in the midst of the land which the Lord will give you as a possession. Verse 4 says, and, and this is the case of the manslayer who flees there that he may live. Whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally, not having hated him in time past. Verse 6, lest the avenger of blood while his anger, or some translations the King James says his heart, while his anger or his heart is hot. Pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long and kill him, though he was not deserving of death since he had not hated the victim in time past. You may be thinking, what in the world is that talking about? Let me explain it real fast. This is God giving instruction to the children of Israel to build sanctuary cities or cities of refuge where people who were in trouble who had accidentally or sometimes intentionally murdered someone could run to and they would be given at least a fair trial. They were called cities of refuge. They started out with three in Israel and what is astonishing is they ended up because God said you need more because there were so many fights, and they even give the illustration in, do, in this chapter that I didn't read of why a city of refuge was so important. They give the illustration in that same chapter, if a man is out chopping wood with his axe and the axe head fall, uh, flies, flies off and hits someone accidentally in the head under the Old Testament law, it was an eye for an eye. If you killed someone, you had the right or their family, their kin, their blood, blood avenger, as the scripture calls it, had the right to take your life. And even if it was an accident, unless you could get to a city of refuge, 
And if you could get to a city of refuge, there would be a jewelry who would hear your case. And if it was decided by these judges that you had accidentally killed somebody in that family, then you could stay in the city of refuge with your family until the high priest died. And when the high priest you came in under died, you could go back to your home and live in peace. And nobody, as the Bible calls them, the blood avengers could not, could not pay you back for accidentally killing their relative. That's what was taking place in this story. What caught my heart was, or caught my attention was, lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer, listen to these words, while his heart is hot or his anger is hot. That, that, that he's recognizing here that people who, who are upset don't, don't really ration good. They don't really think things through good. Be careful when you have a hot heart, when you're angry, when somebody does something and, and, and you, your anger and your resentment is so strong. That's a dangerous thing. Just like what happened in Genesis 4, in the first family that ever inhabited this earth, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and his, hot got, his heart got hot or angry toward his brother, his own brother, Abel. I mean, there's just, there's just the parents and the, and the two boys here, and one of them gets in a heated moment, his heart gets hot and angry, and he slays his brother, Abel, in the first family that ever existed. It's family attacking family. So God saw that this was an issue and they end up, and it's pretty, to me it's pretty profound that they would end up with 42 cities of refuge. Apparently there were a lot of fights breaking out, a lot of uh, issues that people were having, a lot of arguments that people were having. And if they didn't have enough cities of refuge with three, they then added six and then God said, add some more, add some more. And they ended up with 42 cities of refuge in jurisdictions and geographical locations where you could run to because arguments were always breaking out. I think that this whole scenario of Cain slaying Abel shows us that it's possible when, you're, when your heart is hurting and someone has done something to you that has hurt you or hurt one of your family members that you can get what the Bible calls a hot heart or an angry heart. And if you don't deal properly, the Bible didn't say that it's wrong to be angry. The Bible said, be angry. That's part of the emotion. We're made in the image of God and anger is a, is an emotion that God has. So it's not, it's impossible to not get angry. He said, be angry, but sin not. Be angry, but sin not. You can get an angry a heart or a hot heart about something, an injustice that happens to you, but you, we must learn to control our spirits. Proverbs 14 and 17 said, he who is soon angered or quickly angered deals foolishly. The New Living says, short-tempered people do foolish things. The TM says the hot-headed do things they soon regret. The Amplified said he who foams up quickly deals foolishly and plots and plans his revenge. He who foams up easily. Just this week, I received an emergency phone call from uh, uh, Pastor Shane over at Buford. Um, from one of, from, from uh, an incident that happened, his, his mother's, uh, uh, sister's husband is a 62, 63 year old man, an elderly gentleman with physical handicaps and has recently had surgery and so on. And he pulls into a target or some, some, one of these places like that. And, and he's going into the handicap thing, the handicap spot and a person wanted that spot and rolls down the window and begins to scream in rage and anger. And this, is an, this, is an, this man's 10 years younger than this senior citizen. And they get out of the car 
And this man walks up and he hits him for taking the parking space and puts him into a coma. And he's been in intensive care and it's been a nightmare for this family. But it's the very thing of what I'm talking about, a hot heart. Listen to what he said. He who foams up quickly will soon do something foolish and plan and plot his revenge. Proverbs 22 said, an angry man stirs up fights and devises plots. Now keep that in mind. And I want to change gears just a little bit, lean in and listen to what I'm about to tell you. There was a man by the name of Antonio Stradivarius. He was born in the 1700s and he perfected the craft of making violins. These violins that he made are considered to this day the greatest violins. The most, they can make the most beautiful music of any violin up until this time. He's credited with making 900 I think approximately 900 handmade violins, 960. According to what period in his life that he made these violins determines the value of these 960. And they, some of them have been lost in, in different ways. So they only think that there's around 500 that are still in existence. The first period of, of Antonio Stradivarius life was called the long period. And it was the time in between the 1700 to 1725. And if you have a violin that was made in the long period of his life, that's when he was first starting out, the cheapest one would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Recently, one of them that was said to have been played by a general to Napoleon around the campfires as he was conquering the world It recently sold for $3.6 million. But there is another period of his life called the golden period. It's later in his life that if you have a violin that was made during that time, you are really, you're really in a good place and you don't know it. Maybe you picked it up in a garage sale and you don't even know you have a Stradivarius. But if so... Recently, in 2011, one of those violins that was named the Lady Blunt Violin after a famous violinist in Europe sold at London's auction for $15.3 million. But even more astonishing than that, in 2014, Sotheby's uh, auctioneer company had a, a Stradivarius violin that starting bid began at $45 million. So bear that in mind. That's a pretty valuable treasure. This is a story that I heard a minister share that I'm about to share with you about a minister friend of his that saw a Stradivarius that a woman in his church owned. She was an elderly lady. She was wealthy, but not extremely rich. She lived just a kind of a normal life, but she was wealthy because she owned one thing, a Stradivarius violin. And she decided to downsize. She was a senior citizen, decided to downsize due to her age. And she was selling her house and she kept calling her kids. I think they said she had two sons and a daughter and they were grown now and live in the same town, and she kept calling them saying, will you please help me move? Will you please help me move? And she had some health challenges and so on, please. And they would ignore her, and they never had time for her, and they would never help her. And she even changed the date several times when they said they would, and they didn't show up. And they rarely contacted her, rarely checked in with her. Finally, she got her friend to help her pack everything, moved everything herself out into a smaller home in the country, And she had a big yard sale with all of the stuff that she could get rid of and everything that didn't sell because she was in the country. She had a big bonfire and she lit the bonfire in her backyard. Then she took the cell phone and she handed it to her best friend that had helped her. 
and she was an elderly person. And she said, I want you to film this. True story. So the bonfire is behind her, and she's standing there with the Stradivarius violin. And they weren't sure how much this one was worth, but it was certainly worth hundreds of thousands, probably millions. And while her friend is filming her on the cell phone, she says, this is for my sons and daughters, or my sons and my daughter that would not help me and didn't seem to care much about me. She went on to say, the only thing you seem to really care about is the Stradivarius violin that I own. You never call and ask about your mother, but you often inquire about the violin. So enjoy your inheritance. And she took the Stradivarius violin and threw it into the bonfire and then had the camera go close up as it burst into flames. The strings are popping. And can you imagine how those children felt? is they're watching millions go up in smoke. Wow. Can you imagine? Now, there's a couple of morals to this story. Number one, always be sweet and helpful to your mother. Number one, always. Let's learn something today. You came to church to learn something, didn't you? Turn to somebody and say, always treat your mama right. The second moral of this story is be careful what you throw into the flames of anger and resentment. I don't care how hot your heart gets. I mean, I know she was mad at these kids, but she could have sold it and gave a tremendous gift to Free Chapel and we could have done we could have done so much with it for the Lord that I'm dreaming to do. But she, think about what I'm saying. This is a true story. She, in her anger and resentment, burned one of the treasures of the earth. The definition of anger is strong feelings of belligerence aroused by real or supposed wrong. Anger means indignation, rage, fury, deep feelings aroused by, by injustice, violent impulse to retaliate. Another term would be temporary insanity in this case. Resentment is anger that sticks around even after the heart has cooled down. Resentment is bitterness, ill will, ill feeling. Irritation, a grudge, animosity, rancor. We would call it bad blood, a chip on your shoulder. These are the emotions that Jesus taught we must resist. We must not allow to take root in our lives. When I think of the Bible, it's a story of people who burned the greatest treasure. When Cain took that took that weapon and slew his brother in the field in a fit of anger and hostility. And they had some kind of offense. We don't know what was, we know that it was, he was jealous because his brother offered an acceptable sacrifice and God didn't accept his and he slew his brother. And when he did, he burned the Stradivarius what he threw into the fire in the peak of his anger was tremendous. There was a blessing that was in that family, but he threw it in the fire and brought a curse. And he was marked with a mark on his physical body as a sign. This guy has, has gone from being under the blessing of a family to the curse of a family because he threw the greatest treasure, his own flesh and blood into the fire. Haman was filled in the book of Esther with indignation toward Mordecai. Everybody bowed down when he rode through except Mordecai. And Mordecai said, I only bow to Jehovah God. And when he would not bow, 
This rage, this hot anger got a hold of the heart of Haman, this evil man, and he built a gallow, a, a, a hanging uh, place where you would hang somebody by the neck that was, the, your Bible said it was 75 feet tall. That's higher than a ceiling. 75 feet tall. And he built it not knowing that Mordecai was the uncle of the wife of the king. And when the king heard what he was trying to do to his own kin, he said, you're not going to do that. And he hung Haman in the 75 foot gallow that he meant to hang Mordecai the Jew. Not only did he hang him, but he hanged 10 of his sons were hung. What did that man do in a fit of anger? All he had to do, everybody was bowing. It was just one that wasn't bowing. Why are you getting crazy? Why are you letting anger get a hold of you? Haman, calm down. What are you doing? He was throwing the greatest treasure, his children, his family, his position, everything into the fire over anger and bitterness and resentment. He burned the, the, the violin. You'll pay too much if you let unforgiveness and hatred. I wonder how many of you right now, what I'm saying to you is our families are our greatest treasure. Our families are more valuable than a Stradivarius violin. And how many times over arguments and over silly things sometimes and sometimes serious things, but still you don't throw them into the fire. You don't, that's what, that's the thing that Sharice and I had to deal with when we went through things with our children was they, they, they hurt us. They did things that offended us and we had to make a choice. Are we going to throw them into the fire and just cut them off and be done with them? Or are we going to see this is still a treasure and God, they need our love. They need our forgiveness. They need us to be the parents that you want us to be. Nebuchadnezzar built an image and he said, everybody bow down when the music plays. And the Bible said three of his closest counselors, the Bible said he leaned on them. They were 10 times brighter. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were his inside counselors. They were making him famous and rich. And he would ask them the hard questions and they had answers. But when he saw them not bowing down to his command, he brought them before him and he said, you either bow or you will burn. I'm about to throw you three Stradivarius violins into the furnace. And they said, oh, king, we respect you, but we don't bow to anybody but our God. And, he said, and then they said something powerful. They said, our God can deliver us, but if not, he's still God, and we would rather burn than bow. Isn't that powerful? And the Bible said, he said, in a fit of anger, he needs them. They have been a tremendous asset to his kingdom. But in a fit of anger, he's having a falling out. His temper's out of control. His pride and his ego's out of control. And he's trying to throw these three treasures to the kingdom into the fire of anger and resentment. And the Bible said, he said, heat the furnace up seven times hotter and the guards got consumed when they opened the door. But those three Hebrew boys walked right into the fire. But they didn't burn. As a matter of fact, there wasn't even a singe of smoke. The smell of smoke on them. They're in there. They're in a hot place. But they are, they're cool in a hot place. They kept their cool in the furnace. I tell you, when you are growing and maturing is when you can get in a furnace or a hot place, but you're the one that can keep your cool. And the Bible said they kept their cool even though they were in the furnace and they started walking around and the king looked in and he said, I, how many did we put in there? And they said, we put three. He said, I see four and the fourth looks like the son of God. Please come out of there. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. They're cool in the furnace. Turn to somebody and say, be cool in the furnace. Anybody can blow up. Anybody can cuss them out. Anybody can get in a fight. Anybody can give them as good as they send you. Anybody can go after vengeance. But wise people are cool in the furnace.
You know how many people are in prison? Off of one unguarded moment. You know how many people have messed their life up? Because in a moment's time, something happened. When we understand that we've got to control our spirit, not burn and destroy our greatest treasures. I believe that as parents, sometimes we have to decide that we're going to love our children no matter what. That if they, dis you know, at some point they're no longer in your house. They're at the age of accountability. They're 17, 18, 18, and they can go out legally and do what they want to do. At that point, if they're going to live that life, we can just throw them in the furnace and say, I'm done with them. And that's, that's the tendency. Well, they're not living right and they're not, I didn't raise them that way. Don't throw your greatest treasure in the fire. Stay in their life. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care how they're living. You, you stay in their life. Presence is everything. Well, I'm afraid if, if, I stay, if I stay in their life, they'll think I'm okay with what they're doing. They're going to do it anyhow. So why not stay in there and love them? Our homes are our Stradivarius. Our families are our, are, our, are our Stradivarius. Our marriages are our greatest treasure. Don't throw that husband in the fire. Don't throw that wife in the fire. Don't just, I've done, I'm done, I'm through with it. Fight for your family. You see, control your spirit. And to control your spirit is to control your words. I don't want to burn the Stradivariuses in my life, my greatest treasures. And I can't be responsible for what somebody else does, but I can be responsible for my reaction and what I do. Is this little sermon making sense? And so in... In, in my book, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt, I'm going to ask Mac and his precious wife to come up. Uh, the Dyer family, they're precious people, Mac and Stacy Dye. Would you give them a warm welcome? I want to tell you about this couple because they're, they're tremendous people. Thank you. In chapter three of this book, I've known you guys for a long time. Sharice and I love you. Max, a successful businessman. Stacy, how long have y'all been married? 28 years. 28 years. That's pretty amazing. It's awesome. Some of the greatest volunteers in the church, by the way, worked in Kid Pack, worked in this ministry, helped us when we were just a small church, grown it. When, when we do summer extreme He'll pull a camper up out here and live here for about a week, although he's got a very blessed business. He, that, that's his time of sacrifice and honor to the Lord. He works with our children, amazing people. You know, I ask you guys today if, of course, when we got with you about your story, we put it in chapter three of the book because... I wanted to talk about what nobody in the church wants to talk about. What do you do when a child that you've raised in church decides to go a different way of what you raised them and the way that you taught them and you know what the Bible says and you're not, you're not going to change on what the Bible says. I know you guys. I know where you stand on the Word of God and how you honor it and love it. But your son came to you and and he told you that he was, that he was gay. And this is, the, this is the thing that nobody wants to talk about in the church, and yet there are tens of thousands of families in churches, if not hundreds of thousands, who are dealing with this, and, and it's, it's, a, it's something that we're supposed to be quiet about, we're not supposed to talk about. And the Holy Spirit said to me and Sharice with this book, talk about these real, raw issues I did, in, told our story, some of it, in the, in, the, in the first chapter. 
But in the third chapter, we tell your story with your son. So your son came to you, Mac, and you raised him here in this church, and he gave you the big announcement. Do you remember that day, and what, 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 how did it affect you? Mm, uh, day I'll never forget. It was Saturday, uh, 12 o'clock. He calls me and Stacy in the living room, and he says, I got something to tell you. Mind racing, a thousand things. But when he says he's gay, that wasn't even in my, nowhere on my radar did I see that coming. And your reaction is just, you don't know what to say. You don't know how to react. I don't, I don't know what to do. There's anger. When did this happen? Where was it? Where was I when this took place? Is this something that just happened? And, and uh, apparently he had been uh, facing these issues for a very long time. And it just finally got so much, he just, he couldn't, he couldn't hold his load anymore. He wanted to, to come out and, I guess, see where he stood. It was uh, and, and, emotional. And, and you mentioned the anger that you felt at first. Um, kind of, kind of, you know, how did that manifest? Did it, did it turn into arguments? Was it a, was it a tense time? It was very tense. It was, uh, because I couldn't understand it. I, I didn't know where the anger, where, to, where does it come from? And uh, first I was angry at him, but in, in reality I was angry at myself because I missed something along the way. And we argued and just like everybody, I wanted to say you're not and, and this is not you. And it, you know, somewhere along the line we had to come to the conclusion that this is something I had to face and this was him and it's a, uh, you have to turn anger into something else because anger didn't work. And because the, the, the Bible said that the, that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You could have thrown him into the fire, but you got together, Stacy, and y'all talked, and you decided you were going to love like you'd never been hurt. <laughs> like you, that's your son. What, 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 it, Sometimes the problems are so severe in a family that it's a day that changes everything, but it doesn't have to change our love for our child. I like what Billy Graham said. Billy Graham said, it's God's job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict of sin, and it's my job to love. It's my job to love. <laughs> Loving is not lowering your standard. Loving is not compromising on the truth of God's word. Sin is sin, but that doesn't mean I can't love. That doesn't mean I'm going to cut you off, throw you into the fire and say you're on your own. How did you deal with that, Stacy? Well, at first I was angry, but I was really sad because we were so close. And how did I not know this? How did I not know what was going on in your life? Was I blind? But just for him to tell me that, and to come out and say those words, I just felt like I just got to fight and we're going to be a family. We're going to make it through it. So good. That is so good. And so, uh, Mac, you mentioned some of the practical things that you had to, that you had to decide. If you were going to have a relationship, see, it's one thing, folks, to love people when you have the same theology, the same mindset, the same. But how do you love people that are not like you, that don't believe like you are not living like you know they ought to be living, that's when they need your love even more. That's when they need your love even more. And what did that mean for you? Wow. Um, a few things I had to do. Uh, I never followed my son on any social media. Um, I never uh, looked him up. I, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't go there. And we, uh, we had to find common ground, things that we, we found more in common, and as time went on, I, I believe it was a realization on both of us that you know we couldn't always disagree. We couldn't always talk about anything. Uh, our politics are different. Our our beliefs are are uh, we, we we don't stand on the same on everything. And I found that if, if I brought that up, even though I, I didn't really know what to say, that it caused huge fights. But when I began to understand that there's places that we do uh, jive with and we are together on, and, I, and you know, I didn't always know what to say, but I love you always, always filled the gap. And, and how did you stay in his life? 
Um, I mean, we talk, uh, we travel, I go, I go visiting. Um, and I was telling somebody earlier that when I go in to, to visit him, I don't treat him any different. If we go out to eat and he introduces me to the waiter that he knows because that's what he does, um, if he, if he hugs his neck and kisses him on the cheek, I hug his neck and kiss him on the cheek. I mean, you know, just like I would anybody else because, you know, there again, I got my hands on somebody. I got my chance to pray. I show them that, you know, it's not about what they do. You know, that their actions didn't change me. And sometimes that's all, you know, that's all we can do. It's so powerful. So powerful. Stacy, what would you say to... What would you say to families that are out there? Maybe it's not the same exact situation, but maybe it's a child that's, that's living with a lover. They know they ought to be married. They, ought, they know what the Bible says about that lifestyle, but they're living with somebody, or maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, somebody who's going through a, an addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction with one of their children, and it's just bringing heartache and pain to the family and there's always that thing of maybe 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 we just need to just cut it off and say we're done don't give up they they need you more now than they needed you before so always love them give them everything you got your heart is big so use it love your children love your family member it might not even be your child it might be someone you know someone told me in the last service that they they reach out to someone that they know that's not even in their life, but they know that they send them encouragements every day. So I just say love like you've never loved. <laughs> and love, the Bible said, always wins. Love never fails. Would you say that with me? Love never fails. So what do I do, Pastor? What do I do with my parents? That, what do I do with the dad that left me? What do I do? That doesn't mean, as we say in the book, that doesn't mean that everybody has total access back into your life that has hurt you. But it does mean that you at some point must forgive. You can't just throw them into the fire and say, I'm done with them. You've got to get real and honest and from your heart, forgive and let God do a work in and through you. And, and those of you who have challenges similar to what we're talking about, this is God's word to you. Love them. Owe no man nothing but to love them. Love them just like Jesus loves you. Just like Jesus keeps loving you. And he didn't wait till you got every sin out of your life, but he kept loving you. And let's let God deal with the rest because you, your arguing and, and, and anger is not going to change the human heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that and he'll use the weapon of love through you. Do you receive that today? Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. We love you. I, don't, I want you at every campus, I want you at every campus to stand to your feet and please, no one moving. No one moving. This is a sensitive moment. I want to say to those who are hearing that may be the Malcolm, that we love you that we care about you, that we, that we love you. If you're in a lifestyle, if, if you're here today and you're not married and you're living with somebody, we love you. God loves you. And it's time to let God's love do a work in your life. The argument, the fight, it's time to say, Lord, love through me. And I don't know how it's all going to turn out. And sometimes it's an ongoing thing. Come on, say amen. Sometimes there's no quick fix. What's the answer? Just to throw them in the fire, I give up? No, keep loving. And it might take a week, a month, a year, a lifetime, but love will not fail. Keep loving. Keep your own heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room today and you would say, Pastor Jensen, if you're at any of our campuses, you would say, there is a hole in my heart. There's a broken place in my life. I need the love of God. I need the forgiveness of God. I, I, I've thought about throwing somebody into the fire, spiritually speaking. 
I'm dealing with unforgiveness. I'm dealing with resentment. I'm dealing with anger. I'm dealing with hurt. Why don't we just give it to Jesus this morning? Why don't we create an atmosphere where you don't have to play church? But if trouble is in your home, God cares. And it, things change when you seek God and his help. So right now, while, while you're standing there, if you'd say, Pastor, I know this message is for me. In some situation in my life, the enemy has done his best to bring a, a wedge between me and somebody that I love. And I've heard that voice, you know, say in so many words, just throw them into the fire and let the greatest treasure that God's given you, one of them, just be burned up and over. But God is saying, restart your heart today. Bow your heads in prayer, please, all over this room. Pastor, pray for me. I want to get this thing right with God today. I want to get right with God, and I want to get it right with God. I can't help what their reaction will be, but I can get my heart right with God, my attitude right with God, so that when I hear their name, I'm not angry anymore. Pray for me. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can get it all over this room. Raise it high and unashamed. That's beautiful. At every campus, raise it high and unashamed. All the way up in the balcony, wherever you are, at every campus, God sees that hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you with one of the greatest challenges you've ever had. You don't have to do it. But I'm going to tell you that God will do something if you will do it. If you mean business and you raise your hand, Get out of your seat and come stand at the front of the building. I'm going to pray a prayer of release over you. And I believe God's going to do something powerful with every step you take toward the front. You're saying, I surrender. You're saying, I don't want to retaliate. I don't want revenge. I want to put it in God's hands. I'm tired of carrying it. I'm tired of, I'm tired of this hot heart, this angry heart. I just want to give it to God. Maybe you're not, maybe you're here today and you don't even know you're right with God. This is your chance. Step out, humble yourself, walk down that aisle, step forward. Now, not another service, not another day. Maybe, maybe you need to say, Lord, cleanse me, forgive me. Maybe you're the one that's hurt someone. Just come and say, God, I know I've messed up. Help me, help me restore situations that only you can restore. Help me, God. He will hear your cry today. He will. Let's lift our hands up toward heaven. Come on, guys. Come on out. Let's get a song ready. Just lift your hands high all over this room and, and invite the Holy Spirit in the situation. While I've been preaching, you've seen faces. You've thought of people. The Holy Spirit has brought up Stradivariuses in your life that, 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 that you've almost said, I think I'll just burn it and leave it alone. But right now, why don't you just say, God, I'm open. I open up my heart, restart my heart. Lord, I'm willing. Help me. Give me. It's not them that needs the prayer. I need the prayer. So lift your hands right here in the front and just begin to call on the Lord and just say, God, here I am. Here I am. And here's this situation and I surrender it to you. Lift your hands all over this room and worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. Ask Him to touch your heart today concerning that person, that situation. Ask Him. It may be a brother. It may be a sister. It may be a father. It may be a mother. It may be grandparents. It may be a child, a grandchild. Right now, just say, Lord, here, take all this unforgiveness. Take all of this anger. Take all of this, this low grade bitterness. Lord, take it out of my heart and make me and mold me into who you want me to be. I want to love like Jesus. I want to forgive like Jesus. I want to reach like Jesus did. I want to love like Jesus did. Help me and my family. Help us, God. It's complicated, but you're God. It, it's, it's not a simple solution, but you're God. I don't know the answer, but you're God, and I turn to you. Like Jehoshaphat, we know not what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Let's do it all over this room. At every campus, lift your hands high. Sing it now. Lord, we thank you for your promise. 
You're faithful in our families. You're faithful in our marriages. Don't throw that marriage in the fire. Don't throw that husband, that wife in the fire. Ask God to restore the joy. Restore the love. Forgiveness is a choice. Let it work in you now. Just like God forgives you. Just like He does it over and over. Everybody say these words all over at every campus say these words say Lord Jesus I surrender completely to your forgiveness I believe I've heard from you today let the anger go I command it to leave me I receive peace I receive forgiveness and now I release forgiveness in Jesus name I seek you Lord and I thank you that you're changing me and through me I'm going to love like I've never been hurt Lord may I be able to experience your love in my life in my family in my relationships greater than I've ever known it before now let's lift up our hands and let's give God the glory and give Him the praise. I want us to do something. I want us to pray in conclusion the Lord's Prayer. And I speak this over every one of you today. What you did when you walked down that aisle, you don't even know it, but chains were broken. And you are now in a position where God has restarted your heart towards somebody that the enemy wanted to forever separate you from. And again, they may not belong inside the inner circle of your life because some things that have been done, it would be wrong almost for them. to. But you can hear their name and not be angry because God's forgiveness has come in a dynamic measure. Do you receive that this morning? Do you receive that? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Are you ready? Pray it with fervency. This is how we're going to be dismissed today. Pray this prayer. Ready? Let's go. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Stop. Say it again. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Stop. Say it one more time. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen do you receive it give the Lord the biggest praise you can now let me tell you something real quick we're going to Israel in November, and if ever you thought about going, this is the greatest year, it's the 70th anniversary of the nation of Israel. And we're taking a trip, Sharice and I will be with you every day. And boy, if you've ever had interest, this is the trip to go on. Amazing things are happening. And there is a information meeting immediately following this service. We have a representative from the Israeli tour group that we're using or the Israel tour group that we're using that will answer all of your questions. You can find out more about it. You can get more information on it. It'll all be available. That's going to be in the connections lounge, I think. Is that right or is it downstairs? It's downstairs in the choir room. And if you don't know where that is, ask anybody. But it's downstairs in the choir room. 
and it'll be a quick meeting, but boy, you'll get, you'll, you, if you have desire to go to Israel, you need to go get in that because the trip is almost full and you need to get in on it pretty quick if you're going to do it. They also have payment plans, any way you want to do it. Amazing opportunity. Check it out. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Have a great week, everybody. Help it. Pray for us as we go out and continue to reach people with this message of hope and love. God bless you and God bless your family. Before we leave here today, I do want to encourage you, if you haven't yet got your copy of Pastor Jensen's brand new book, Love Like You've Never Been Heard, I encourage you to go ahead and get your copy wherever books are sold. And don't just get one for yourself, get one for someone else that needs an encouraging word in their life. But we love you so much. Let us know how we can pray for you, whether you're on Facebook Live. doesn't matter what outlet you are joining us on today. Let us know how we can pray for you, and we want to see God continue to move in your life. We love you so much, and we will see you next Sunday morning.